The road begins to rise in a series of gentle curves, passing through pleasing groves of olive and vines. Five kilometers on the left is the fork for Florence. To the right may be seen the Tower of Sacrifice, 470 steps, built in 1535 by Niccolo de Ferramano. Superstitious fear left the tower intact when in 1549 the surrounding village was completely destroyed. Triumphantly, Caroline lifted her finger from the fine italic type. There was nothing to mar the success of this afternoon. For the first time, she had taken the Italian guidebook Neville was always urging on her, and hesitatingly, haltingly, she had managed to piece out enough of the language to choose a route that took in four well-thought-of frescoes, two universally admired campaniles, and one wooden crucifix in a village church quite a long way from the main road. It was not, after all, such a bad thing that a British council meeting had kept Neville in Florence. Perhaps there would just be time to add this tower to her dutiful collection. What was it called? She bent to the guidebook again carefully tracing the text with her finger to be sure she was translating it correctly word by word. But this time her moving finger stopped abruptly at the name of Niccolo de Ferramano. There had risen in her mind a picture, no, no, not a picture, a portrait of a thin white face with deep-set eyes that stared intently into hers. Why a portrait, she asked. And then she remembered. It had been about three months ago, just after they were married, when Neville had first brought her to Florence. He himself had already lived there for two years, and during that time had been at least as concerned to accumulate Tuscan culture for himself as to disseminate English culture to the Italians. She had been proud to accompany Neville to castles and palaces privately owned to which his work gave him entry, and there to gaze with what she hoped was pleasure on the undiscovered Raphael, the Titian that had hung on the same wall ever since it was painted the Giotto fresco under which the family that had originally commissioned it still said their prayers. It had been on one of these pilgrimages that she had seen the face of the young man with the black eyes. In a castle at the top of a hill, she had followed Neville dutifully along a gallery lined with five centuries of family portraits, listening politely while in his light, well-bred voice he had told her some intimate anecdotes of history. And, involuntarily, she had let her eyes wander round the room. It was thus that her eye was caught by a face on the other side, and forgetting what was due to politeness, she caught her husband's arm and demanded, Neville, who's that girl over there? But he was pleased with her. He said, Ah, I'm glad you picked that one out. It's generally thought to be the best thing in the collection, a bronzino, of course. And they went over to have a look at it. The picture was painted in rich pale colours, a green curtain, a blue dress, a young face with calm brown eyes under plaits of honeycomb hair. Caroline read out the name under the picture. Giovanni de Ferramano, 1531 to 1549. That was the year the village was destroyed, she remembered now, sitting in the car by the roadside. But then she had exclaimed, Neville, she was only 18 when she died. Oh, they married young in those days, Neville commented. And Caroline said in surprise, oh, was she married? It had been the radiantly virginal character of the face that had caught her inattention. Yes, she was married, Neville answered, and added, look, look at the portrait beside her. And this was when Caroline had seen the pale young man. There were no clear light colours in this picture. There was only the whiteness of the face, the blackness of the eyes, the hair, the clothes, and the glint of gold letters on the pile of books, on which the young man rested his hand. Underneath this picture was written, Portrait of an Unknown Gentleman. Do you mean he's her husband? Surely they'd know if he was, instead of calling him an unknown gentleman. Oh, he's Niccolo de Ferramano, all right. I've seen another portrait of him somewhere, and it's not a face one would forget. But there's apparently some queer scandal about him. And though they don't turn his picture out, they won't mention his name. Last time I was here, the old Count himself took me through the gallery. I asked him about little Giovanna and her husband. It was horribly clear that I shouldn't have asked. He said... Either, oh, she was lost or she was damned, but which word it was, I can never be sure. The portrait of Nicola he just ignored altogether. What was wrong with Nicola, I wonder? Oh, I don't know, but I can guess. Do you notice the lettering on those books up there under his hand? It's all in Hebrew or Arabic. Undoubtedly, the unmentionable Nicola dabbled in black magic. Caroline shivered. I don't like him, she said. Let's look at Giovanna again. And they'd moved back to the first portrait, and Neville had said casually, Do you know, she's rather like you. Caroline put the guidebook back in the pigeonhole under the dashboard and drove carefully along the gentle curves 
until she came to the fork for Florence on the left. On the top of a little hill to the right stood a tall, round tower. There was no other building in sight. Caroline knew that she wanted to take the fork to the left, to Florence and home and Neville and, said an urgent voice inside her, for safety. This voice so much shocked her that she got out of the car and began to trudge up the dusty track towards the tower. The tower was built of narrow red bricks and only thin slits pierced its surface right at the top where Caroline could see some kind of narrow platform encircling it. Before her was an arched doorway. I'm just going to have a quick look, she assured herself again. And then she walked in. She was in an empty room with a low arch ceiling. A narrow stone staircase clung to the wall and circled round the room to disappear through a hole in the ceiling. There ought to be a wonderful view at the top, said Caroline firmly to herself. And she laid her hand on the rusty rail and started to climb. And as she climbed, she counted. Thirty-nine, forty, forty-one, she said. And with the forty-first step, she came through the ceiling and saw over her head, far, far above, the deep blue evening sky, a small circle of blue framed in a narrowing shaft round which the narrow staircase spiralled. There was no inner wall. Only the rusty railing protected the climber on the inside. It's getting dark very quickly, said Caroline at the 150th step. I know what the tower is like now. It would be much more sensible to give up and go home. At the 269th step, a hand moving forward on the railing made only empty space. For an interminable second she shivered, pressing back to the hard brick on the other side. Then, hesitatingly, she groped forwards, upwards, and at last her fingers met the rusty rail again, and again she climbed. At the 375th step, the rail, as her moving hand clutched it, crumbled away under her fingers. I'd better just go by the wall, she told herself, and now her left hand traced the rough brick as she climbed up and up. 422, 423, counted Caroline with part of her brain. I really ought to go down now, said another part. I wish, oh, I want to go down now. But she could not. It would be silly to give up, she told herself, desperately trying to rationalize what drove her on, just because one's afraid. And then she had to stifle that thought too. And there was nothing left in her brain but the steadily mounting tally of the steps. Four hundred and seventy, said Caroline aloud. And then she stopped abruptly, because the steps had stopped too. There was nothing ahead but a piece of broken railing barring her way, and the sky drained now of all its colour was still some twenty feet above her head. But how idiotic, she said to the air. The whole thing's absolutely pointless. And then the fingers of her left hand, exploring the wall beside her, met not brick, but wood. She turned to see what it was, and there in the wall, level with the top step, was a small wooden door. So it does go somewhere after all, she said, and she fumbled with a rusty handle. The door pushed open, and she stepped through. She was on a narrow stone platform about a yard wide. It seemed to encircle the tower. The platform sloped downwards away from the tower, and its stones were smooth and very shiny. And this was all she noticed before she looked beyond the stones and down. She was immeasurably, unbelievably high and alone, and the ground below was a world away. It was not credible, not possible, that she should be so far from the ground. All her being was suddenly absorbed in the single impulse to hurl herself from the sloping platform. I cannot go down any other way, she said. And then she heard what she said and stepped back frenziedly clutching the soft rotten wood of the doorway with hands sodden with sweat. There is no other way, said the voice in her brain. There is no other way. This is vertigo, said Caroline. I've never had it before, but I know what it is, and it's vertigo. She closed her eyes and kept very still and felt the cold sweat running down her body. I shall be all right now, she said at last and carefully she stepped back through the doorway onto the 470th step and pulled the door shut before her. She looked up at the sky swiftly darkening with night. 
Then, for the first time, she looked down into the shaft of the tower, down to the narrow, unprotected staircase, spiralling round and round and round and round and disappearing into the dark. She said, she screamed, I can't go down. She began to cry, shuddering with the pain of her sobs. It could not be true that she'd brought herself to this peril, that there could be no safety for her unless she could climb down the menacing stairs. At last she stopped crying and said, Now I shall go down. One, she counted, and her right hand tearing at the brick wall, she moved first one and then the other foot down to the second step. Two, she counted, and then she thought of the depth below her and stood still, stupefied with terror. The stone beneath her feet, the brick against her hand, were two frail protections for her exposed body. They could not save her from the voice that repeated that it would be easier to fall. Abruptly, she sat down on the step. Two, she counted again, and spreading both her hands tightly against the step on each side of her, she swung her body off the second step, down onto the third. Three, she counted, then four, then five pressing closer and closer into the wall, away from the empty drop on the other side. At the 21st step, she said, I think I can do it now. She slid her right hand up the rough wall and slowly stood upright. Then with the other hand, she reached for the railing. It was now too dark to see, but it was not there. For timeless time, she stood there knowing nothing but fear. 21, she said, 21. 21. Over and over again, but she could not step onto the 22nd step. Something brushed her face. She knew it was a bat and not a hand that touched her, but still it was horror beyond conceivable horror. And it was this horror, without any sense of moving from dread to safety, that at last impelled her down the stairs. 23. 24. 25, she counted, and around her the air was full of whispering skin-stretched wings. If one of them should touch her again, she must fall. 26, 27, 28. The skin of her right hand was torn and hot with blood, for she would never lift it from the wall, only press it slowly down and force her rigid legs to move from the knowledge of each step to the peril of the next. So Caroline came down the dark tower. She could not think. She could know nothing but fear. Only her brain remorselessly recorded the tally. Five hundred and one, it counted. Five hundred and two, and three, and four, and five.